this talk is structured on a simple thesis. Now, we live in an age that is witnessing the rise of the hyper-empowered individual. An individual I call homo digitalis, as detailed in my book, War in 140 Characters, available in all good bookshops and on Amazon if you're cheap. So be sure to get that. Now, he, and indeed she, has the power to shape events in periods of crisis, by which I mean conflict, which I look at in the book, and also periods of great political crisis. Shape them at the individual level now more than ever. So I'm going to begin with a story. Or maybe not. I met Vitali, this is Vitali, in Siberia. It was early spring of 2015. He spoke barely any English, but he was charming. On his right arm, he had a tattoo of the singer Marilyn Manson. On his left leg, he had a tattoo of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> now, I was there to hear Vitali's story, and it was a strange one. Uh, and one I would not have believed had I not spent a year in 2014 covering the war between Russia and Ukraine. For a few months of his life, back in August 2014, Bikali became a weapon of the Russian state in its war against Ukraine. He didn't carry a gun or drive a tank or wear a uniform, but he became a weapon nonetheless. And one arguably more effective than any I saw fighting on the battlefield. Vitali became a troll. Now, we're all accustomed to trolls. They've been around for as long as the internet has, at least Web 2.0, when people could post things and things came a bit more interactive. But Vitaly was a troll of a different order. Like a bee in a hive, he was one of just many that worked in a nondescript building in central St. Petersburg, one that would grain infamy as Russia's national troll factory. And here it is. As you can see, it's extremely nondescript and dull-looking. Now, it's become almost a cliche to say that we live in a post-truth age. Indeed, this is the subject in many ways of my talk. Now, social media has done many positive things. It has enabled uh, a light to be shone on the powerless and voiceless. But through its ability to circumvent traditional media, it has also contributed to the spread of misleading and outright falsehood, what we call fake news. Users flood Twitter with hoaxes, uh, Facebook is awash with detailed conspiracy theories, blaming world crises on everything from the alarm of the Illuminati to inevitably the Jews. Facts have never been so under threat. And this is a crack that the Kremlin understands perfectly and lies at the heart of its propaganda. Now, it was early 2014, and Vitaly was in the Russian city of St. Petersburg. Now, Vitaly was a journalist, but he ran into some bad luck. The website that he worked for ran out of funding. So he was desperate for a job. He searched everywhere. He sent off so many CVs, he couldn't even keep track anymore. Finally, he got a response. It was from a, a media company. Nondescript. He wasn't sure what he was getting into, but they offered him a job, and he accepted it. And so began one of the most surreal and, in the end, unpleasant experiences of Vitali's life. Now, it, everything had a structure. He had entered the troll farm, and it had a clear structure. So, Vitaly, as a journalist, was sent to the first floor, where he worked on a project called Ukraine 2. Now, what was happening on the first floor in Ukraine 2 was that he was writing articles from websites with the ending .ua. That is to say, pretending that they were Ukrainian news websites. So what he would do is he would stick as much to the truth as possible, but with some key differences. He could never call the separatists terrors, terrorists, rather they had to be resistance fighters. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't, for example, ever criticize Putin, and he used certain stylistic tricks. So he would call Van Ukraine as opposed to Na Ukraine, and there's a, a difference in Russian, which I don't speak, that basically one means in Ukraine and the other means along Ukraine. One essentially is saying that Ukraine is part of Russia. Another is saying that Ukraine is uh, an independent state. Now, that was Vitaly on the first floor. On the second floor were the social media department. The people made memes, cartoons, all these sorts of things to spread around the internet. The third floor were the bloggers. These were Ukrainian, inverted commas, and foreign bloggers, usually pretending to be Americans, and the Ukrainian bloggers would say that there was no food in the Ukrainian kindergartens, that Kiev didn't have electricity, while the American, fake American bloggers would say that 
the West supported Putin's war against the fascists in Ukraine. And actually, what was funny was that often these blogs ended up becoming the sources for the fake articles that were written on the first floor. So it was literally a merry-go-round of lies. On the fourth floor were the big boys and girls, the Facebook, Twitter, and Vcontacta trolls. Vcontacta is, is uh, the Russian version of Facebook. It's a wonderfully Russian thing where they've literally just ripped it off entirely. It's even blue and white. It's exactly the same. Uh, so Vcontacta is obviously a big source for people in the Russia-Ukrainian space. So that, these, these guys were very important. They were polygraphed once a week, and, uh, but Vitaly never got to them. But anyway, so what Vitaly did was he was writing fake journalists, and, um, you know, it was essentially, he was writing these, sorry, fake articles, but then he got moved. He got sent to the second floor to join the cartoon and meme makers. And it was here that he really got thrown into the deep end. And it's quite funny because there was a real hierarchy in the troll farm, in that Vitaly and the people, him, who were writing the websites, uh, they were journalists. So they kind of looked down on the others. They thought, well, you know, we're trolls, but at least we're educated trolls. So he really hated the, uh, social, media, uh, the social media department. And actually, he asked to go and sit back down on the first floor with his old friends. But nonetheless, his only job was now to promote the fake websites on social media. And that was fit, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Vcontacta, LiveJournal, YouTube, everywhere. Now, this is very instructive. What he was told to do is extremely instructive in the way that you spread, disseminate information. It's propaganda in this case, but generally in this age, there are certain key things that he had to observe. So, we start with the outright fakery. Now, in order to register an account on Vcontacta, maybe the case with Facebook now, I don't know, I was so long ago since I joined, you have to register a phone number. So he was just given a whole bunch of phone of SIM cards in order to re register multiple Vcontacta accounts. Interestingly, he was always told to make them female accounts because it was believed that female accounts would be more trusted than men. Now we get into the interesting part. So most people, he was told, don't actually read the text. So what you have to do, well, first thing he was told, let me, let me roll back a bit. The first thing he was told is that you are competing with people scrolling through their phones. People are scrolling. You've got about one to two seconds to attract their attention. So you've got to make them stop. So what you need is an arresting image. The second thing he was told is that even if you make them stop on that image, they're probably not going to click through and read the article. So that image has to make them stop, and it has to be a way of leaving the message in itself. So this is what he worked on. He worked, spent hours creating memes about Ukrainian fascists, the greatness of Putin, and the perfidiousness of Barack Obama, often extremely racist, and Angela Merkel, and leading Ukrainian figures. So we'll look at a couple of examples of his work. So here's Barack Obama, and he's saying, I want to start a war but none of my friends will join me. The clear indication being that America was stirring up trouble in Ukraine. Uh, a second one, we have an angry looking Obama in the first panel going, we don't talk to terrorists. In the second panel, he's grinning going, we just sponsor them. Again, this is a, a blood spattered Obama taking a bite out of Ukraine. Pretty basic stuff, but effective. Also, it wasn't just to attack it was also to boost the separatists. So here we have the famously attractive prosecutor general of Crimea who actually defected to the Russians as soon as they invaded. And it, what, you, what it actually says, but you can't see, is it says uh, Crimea is ours and so are the visas, indicating that all Crimean citizens would get Schengen visas. Again, it was, you know, pretty basic stuff, but it was effective. Now, social media we were told would bring us all together. It's transnational, it creates networks. And to a degree, this is true. I can now speak to someone in Paris, my friend in Australia, my friend in the US, on Facebook chat, on Skype, whatever. People, we have never been so proximate. But at the same time, it shatters unity and it divides people. And it does this in two overarching ways. That's uh, some separatists that I was with, okay. So it does it in two overarching ways. The first is obvious, okay? It sets people at loggerheads. You, you see this everywhere. You see it's Brexit, Corbyn, Trump, people rowing on Facebook, people rowing on Twitter, people unfriending each other, people unfollowing each other, blocking each other. So it creates venues in which we can directly clash. But it does something else more insidious. What it does is it also cocoons us. 
it creates us, it creates bonds with like-minded others. Now, what we have to understand, I mean, they say that the guy that invented gambling was great, but the guy that invented chips was a genius. I always say the guy that invented social media was great, but the guy that invented the language around it was a genius. Now, think about the language that surrounds social media. Why is a news feed called a news feed when it doesn't actually consist of news in any real sense? Why is it called a gossip feed? Or a, you know, or a <laughs> fake news feed or a misleading feed? Why is a platform called a platform? This is a very interesting thing because it's a very neutral term. Platform has this idea that it's a very neutral space where we can all get on there and we can have a chat, we can voice our opinions. But at the end of the day, social media are not social media companies, social media uh, platforms are not neutral. They are capitalist enterprises designed to make money. They're businesses, which is fair enough. But we have to understand this. And their product, what is their product? Their product is us, their users. And this means two things. First of all, it means they are ill-served by kicking us off their platforms. And you see this problem with the tech hearings and all the fake news ads that were bought, all the trolls that were not kicked off. And the second thing is they create algorithms. And these algorithms provide us with content that they believe that we will like in order to keep us on their platforms. Now, what this means is when you come to political and conflict situations, you are fed in information that reinforces your worldview. Now, let's take an example. 20 years ago, an Arab-Israeli conflict. You had pro-Israeli, pro-Arab supporters, but both would have watched the same footage coming out of CNN or BBC, footage that was produced by professional journalists, has editorial standards, proper editors, proper cameramen, proper journalists. Now, a researcher, Gilad Lotan, mapped, he created a graph for the Israeli 2014 war against Hamas Operation Protective Edge, mapping where users got their information from, and he mapped them as nodes. And the pro-Israeli and the pro-Palestinian sides did not overlap except in one instance, the left-leaning Haaretz. Everything else was from totally different sources. What this means is 20 years ago, both sides would have watched the same stuff. They would have come to their own conclusions, sure. Now, you are fed different realities. Every image you see, everything you read, reinforces your own reality. And what this means is the person who disagrees with you is no longer someone who is wrong or who disagrees with you, but someone who's a liar, who's a fantasist, who's evil, someone who is clearly, clearly dishonest at every level. Thus does conflict become easier, thus is our hatred and prejudices reaffirmed and exacerbated. In 2016, Post Truth was named Word of the Year by Oxford Dictionaries, and it's worth reading this out. It was defined as an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And according to the Oxford Dictionaries president, this is even more instructive. It is not surprising that our choice reflects a year dominated by highly charged political and social discourse, fueled by the rise of social media as a news source and a growing distrust of facts offered up by the establishment. Post-truth as a concept has been finding its linguistic footing for some time. Now, in the end, you know, we can all talk about Trump. I despise Trump. Most people despise Trump. But there is a difference between him and Putin. Trump still leads the world's largest democracy. Putin is a dictator in all but name. But in one sense, they are the same. In one sense, and it is this, in that they seek not to twist the truth like the politicians of old, but to subvert the very idea that an objective truth exists at all. Thus, we go from Bill Clinton, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, a lie, to Donald Trump or his spokesperson who can come out and say, my inauguration crowds were bigger than Obama's when you can see that they weren't. You can see it. And what happens when they're called out on this? Kellyanne Conway comes out and says, well, we're offering alternative facts, which is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as an alternative fact. A fact, it is a fact or it is not. Uh, alternative opinions, but not alternative facts. So what we are living in is, and this, what makes this so dangerous, I'm going to conclude with this, I was going to go on for a bit longer, but I'll prefer a long Q&A, is that this is a different order of lying. This is a different order of dishonesty. This is, this is totalitarian. This is what you saw you did not see. 
You cannot trust your eyes or your senses. You must trust us, the politicians. We live in a world that has never been, since the Second World War, so politically unstable. And this is timed with the emergence of a very destabilizing technology. Now, I just want to talk quickly about the history of information technologies. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, you've probably heard this. At every stage in history, when a new information technology has emerged, destabilization has occurred. So we take the printing press, the invention of the printing press. So what happened was this meant that the Catholic Church would no longer be the sole arbiter of the text and the people. What happened? The wars of religion followed. Then the great mass expansion of TV and radio in the 1920s. Platforms that were then used by Hitler and Mussolini, a decade later we know what happened. Now I'm not saying we're heading into a very big world war, what I'm saying is that at each time new information technologies emerge, we go through destabilizing periods. Now this happens to have coincided with a deep crisis of faith in the West. So you take those two together and it's extremely unstable, extremely volatile. And what it does is it changes the nature of war and it makes the boundaries between war and peace less porous. And this is dangerous because the, war more, the more war becomes politics, as I argue in my book it does, the more dangerous it becomes because politics never ends. We live in a day, an age destabilized by the digital revolution and we need to address this sooner rather than later. At the time of the Second World War, you think about you know, whether it was Germany or Japan, um, it would have been emotion and you know, personal belief that would have sort of driven people's, uh, you know, not objective sure. facts. And secondly, each of the sides wouldn't have been sharing the same media. I mean, obviously, Germany would have had a lot of propaganda, same as Japan. So sure. is, it, is it really a new phenomenon? It's something new, we've seen for, you know, 70 yeah. years. It's a new phenomenon in the sense that you can now see what's actually happening in the war zone. So it's actually a lot harder for, um, I mean, I look, I'll give you an example, right? Let's take Russian propaganda. So if you look at Soviet propaganda, it was always positive and intent. It was this idea that the Soviet Union was the utopian society. Communism was the ideal system. So what the Soviet Union could do is it could claim there was no famine in Ukraine, right? And Walter Durante could go over there and win a Pulitzer Prize saying there's no famine in Ukraine. You can't do that now. So war, it would have been different in the sense that, that yes, people would have believed the propaganda, but realities, you know, there's still a crushing of reality. This is the paradox, right? You are cocooned, but at the same time, you can't escape the information coming out of the war zone. This is why I talk about why asymmetrical warfare isn't so asymmetric anymore. I'm kind of conflating things here, but uh, what I'm saying is it would be different. It would be similar in that people would believe their own, uh, their own sort of um, uh, propaganda. And, you, and the Second World War is an interesting thing because it, is the, it shows the apex of information and the state working together. That's when it really reached its apex, that they work together. Now you get that almost by yourself, by who you friend and follow. Uh, actually, this is the point I actually want to come back to, actually, um, and you reminded me of it, which is understand the nature of propaganda. So as I say, before, it was about, you know, Russia. Let's take, we'll take Russia's article about, you know, promoting a positive vision of Russia. Now, Russia doesn't try and do this. It doesn't, it doesn't bother. I'm sure it would like to, but it probably realizes that it's, it, it's not going to work. But what it does instead is it floods the information space with so many conflicting narratives that your, your ability to recognize the truth when you see it is diminished. And I saw this in, in Ukraine when I was there. And do you know about the flight MH17 that was shot down over eastern Ukraine? They shot down. So obviously the Russians uh, gave a, a missile to Cyprus and they shot it down. Now I was in Ukraine and we, we, you know, this plane came, was shot down. I was on Twitter. And then suddenly, within minutes, minutes, all these narratives started, you know. It was the Ukrainians that did it. It was the Americans that did it. It was the Ukrainians and the Americans that did it. It was the Dutch secret services that put a bomb on the plane. The point is, each of these was ludicrous. But that wasn't the point. The point was that if you're a normal guy, if you're not like me, if you actually have a life beyond, beyond all this shit, then you would go on and think, oh, what's happening? You'd, you'd be so bewildered, you'd think, oh, forget this. So you just shut your laptop and you go. Sorry, I think I, I went quite circular there, but uh, you got me onto a point that I needed to make, so thanks. Thank you very much.